Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my great, great honor to be here to share my topic, um, some, share some lights about the whole five conference, climate change, um, and healthy thanks to everyone here. And thanks again for your patience. For my great honor to be here. And thanks for coming as well. Um, yeah, summer is almost over. I can't <laughs> believe that. And the new semester starts soon. Yeah, so, well, it's not my first time to be in this. It's my second time. Whether it's better compared to Boston, and then people are nicer. Definitely, <laughs> I cannot believe everyone say hi. How are you? <laughs> All the time. So um, yeah, so I will quickly introduce myself briefly um, by showing what I'm doing, um, what's the scope I'm doing, and then talk about our three topics today: um, specific coal biopower and reduce burden. Thinking about is there any way we can do to make a coal fired power plant better by retrofitting like sucks control system in coal fired power plants? And then the third one is um, let's jump out from air pollution and talk about GHG greenhouse gas directly, specific CO2 emissions. And those CO2 emissions are mostly from developing countries such as China or India. Is there any way we can predict um, what is the peak? and how much China or India will emit in 2030, 2040, 2050. So that's the third topic. Um, well, there are a couple of ways to do that. Um, we provide a novel way to think about a, a very interesting way by using a different historical data from the other countries. And then talk about a little bit about what's the next step, what we can do for the future. So, um, uh, Susan just introduced myself. Um, so uh, I was graduated from Harvard this May. Um, I graduated from Cultural Medical University in Taiwan since 2012, and I practiced clinically in the hospital for two years. Just uh, briefly stopped by in Peru and came to Harvard. Uh, my study focused on three topics. The biggest chunk of what I'm doing right now is climate or energy related uh, topics. So like coal biopower plants and some economic uh, analysis like carbon price, uh, cap and trade. This is a collaboration with uh, Wang Wu. Wang Wu is a professor in uh, Chinese, science, Chinese Science Academy. It's a very prestigious um, school in China. Well, I'm a Taiwanese, I'm not Chinese, but uh, well, it's quite sensitive right now. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I have no issue with Chinese, and we work really well. <laughs> It said one funny thing, like we wrote a paper together and he contributed a lot. We worked really well. At the end of the publication, I, when I submit the paper in the manuscript, he said, uh, can I recheck my name? I said, why? Because in your figure, you put Taiwan as an independent country. <laughs> <laughs> hey, seriously, this is a great line for um, the professor working in China. So, okay. Um, the statement. Uh, the scope of my research is uh, OEM related, occupational environmental medicine related. So, specific two topics. One is a uh, petrochemical industry complex. Uh, people living close to PIC, petrochemical industrial complex, has higher risk of either leukemia, lung cancer, um, uh, or those diseases. Uh, and analysis. Uh, the second scope, uh, second topic of OEM related project is uh, overwork related uh, cardiovascular disease. It's not an issue here in India, but it's a serious issue in Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. You cannot believe a lot of people, especially white collar workers, they work 7 to 10 and every day, and even Saturday, the night, those working in Wall Street. So I don't know why they are busy for, but they are super busy every day and work overwork all the time. So we talk about how can we modify the diagnostic criteria and how can we improve the diagnostic rate of uh, the work related cardiac And the third topic, a uh, third scope of my research is chemical related um, because I have some, have some collaboration with um, those old colleagues uh, for hospitals. So I also touch those individual data uh, and <coughs> clinical research as well. Well, let's go back to what we are talking about energy climate change related uh, issues. Well, there are a lot of experts here. This is a well known study done. Uh, from Harvard as well, like 20 years ago in 2009, published in NGM, um, Darby and Pop study. 
the xs is showing a concentration of 10 to 0.5 y-axis is life expectancy it says clearly how each star represents a country or a city it says clearly a uh, higher concentration a city or a town has um, the lower life expectancy before you get there so they run a regression model and then show like by reducing PN 2.5 by a factor of 10 microgram per, per cubic meter, the life expectancy can be saved by half to one year after adjusting some of these factors. So this is um, this is not a scientific fallacy. This is not fake news. This is true. <laughs> and <then laughs> subsequent study repeatedly proved yeah, this is true across the world. But the next question is, um, this is a NASA satellite derived PN 2.5 concentration in 2015. It's like a band. The highest concentration concentrate are located in China, India, Iran, Middle East, and Sahara Desert. What it doesn't tell us is the composition. We understand, well, we maybe understand why we have higher concentration in China, India. But what we don't know is what's the composition or what's that, what happened in Sahara Desert. Well, that's true too, because if you still think um, PN2.5 is the most important risk factor, environmental risk factor um, of lung cancer, that picture doesn't perfectly match with lung cancer incidence among males upper panel and females lower panels. The highest lung cancer incidence occurred in North America, uh, European countries. Why? Well, we don't think about the most important risk factor smoking, tobacco smoking. And also from an epidemiologist perspective, uh, especially during the global health, there are a lot of under-report, over-report issues across countries. So there are a lot of over-diagnosis and maybe under-report in African countries. But also, the third how critical, maybe a key component about the PM2.5 is PM2.5 composition has great spatial and temporal variation. And we never think about that deeply. Um, well, it's quite controversial because current research still think a size matter rather than the composition. Well, but it's quite controversial. Let's take a success example or SO4 as an example. In the Western US in winter time, it composes roughly just 8%. But in the summertime, in eastern U.S., maybe 26 percent. That's a huge difference. Besides that, we know PM 2.5 is composed of different components. And also we know there are a lot of contributors contribute to PM 2.5, and those will cause lung cancer. For general public, what they are really care about is not this gray box. They have a limited understanding of that. What they really care about is who are the culprits, who are the contributors of lung cancer, or what's the percentage, what's the proportion of those contributors to lung cancer. So that's what I am really interested in and want to focus on this topic. My hypothesis is the more electricity, electric capacity from coal power plants in a given country the higher either mortality or incident cases of lung cancer will be. So basically, this is an ecological study, it's a global study, and talking about from each country, how many coal by problems you have, and what's the lung cancer um, you will have after adjusting the other covariates. So what we are doing is, um, we collect over 13, more than 13,000 13, generation units from coal among 83 countries from 2000 to 2016. To my surprise, um, I never realized that among the 200 countries, less than half of countries have, have ever had coal fire problems. So a lot of African countries does not have coal fire problems at all. And also a lot of island countries never ever have coal fire problems. So only 83 countries have coal fire problems. And what I'm really interested in the exposure of interest is per capita coal capacity. The reason I pick up this as my exposure of interest is, think about that. So the population in Taiwan is like 22 million, which is similar as Canadian. But the thing is that the size of the two countries is a huge difference. 
And how can you summarize that as an other country label? So we use a per capita coca mechanism. It's like a per capita GDP sort of thing. I think about how many people use energy from coca and coca. That's our exposure of interest. Oh, by the way, coal capacity is just a, a unit as a megawatt. It's just a, a matrix or index measuring how many, how, what's the generating capacity from coal. So, for example, 100 megawatt coal by power. 100, what's that mean? It's just like median size of coal by power. In the United States, we have roughly 40% of the electricity generated from coal. In China, in countries, they have 70%. Probably 67 to 70 percent electricity from coal. So again, let's go back to the basic characteristics of this uh, research. As we expected, uh, lung cancers among males decreased from 455 per 100,000 people uh, to 400, probably 400 in 2016. Gradually decreasing. But among females, actually, the lung cancer incidence rates increase. The average incidence rates are increased about greater. Uh, this is already age standardized, standardized by the WHO um, poor population. But for smoking prevalence, uh, it decreased both among males and females. We carefully adjust the other core barriers uh, in our study, including the traffic index, which capture the air pollution from traffic. And also, we think about industrialization index and GDP and total coal consumption. So once you import the coal, coal just not coal is not just used in generating electricity. You also use in industry and sometimes using residential consumption. For those, um, like for example, in China, back then they burn the coal to generate the heat. So they have the coal burning heaters. So that's why we use a total coal consumption. Think about how much coal. So um, this is a figure showing the national coal capacity in 2000, 2005, 2010, and 2015. Roughly speaking, every country needs an outcome more and more coal. And this one is picking up the top five countries using most coal, and to see the coal capacity, total coal consumption and the total electricity generating capacity means like generating capacity from different sources. And for coal percentage, it's just coal capacity divided by total electricity capacity. So which means what's the percentage of coal in your country to generate electricity? For, as I say, in the United States, roughly 40%. In China, roughly like 70 most country, European country and United States, um, decreased the coal percentage after 2000 of gradually. Only China and keep their um, coal percentage as high as 70. Well, there are certain reasons for that. National security, they don't want to rely their energy to the other countries. Um, so this is a very complex, the energy matrix is a very com complicated <coughs> issue. Um, when the country decided they want to use coal or different energy, there are other behind <coughs> But anyway, what we are doing is running our logistic, uh, sorry, our Poisson regression model. Um, the left-hand side of the equation is a lung cancer incidence. And the right-hand side, what we are really care about is the side, uh, effect size of the capital core capacity. And for the capital T, we carefully adjust the latency. Latency means we don't believe the lung cancer this year is associated with coal capacity this year. Also. We think it's associated with 10 years ago. So you have like enough time to have lung cancer to occur. And we also do a falsification test, which means we pick out the colon rectal cancer, PRC, as a falsification outcome because we hypothetically didn't believe there's association between CRC and coal so um, raw data here, uh, we saw um, roughly a significant association between coal capacity in long form and the incident in long form as well. So this is a strong association among males in different time periods. 
And we also see the similar pattern among emails. So this is the raw data. We didn't adjust anything. We just see a snapshot of different time periods among the kind of emails respectively. Then we run a regression model. Sorry, but just a regression model. So I will interpret this data as saying by increasing per capita per per capita core capacity, one kilowatt per person, the relative the relative risk is 1.59 for lung cancer. So actually it's really hard for the average um, co per capita core capacity increasing by one kilowatt per person in a whole country. So it's really hard to compare the magnitude of 1.59 or 1.03. The 1.03 says by increasing 1% of smoking prevalence in your country, the risk of lung cancer incident will increase by a factor of 3%. But by increasing a lung cancer, a smoking prevalence by 1% in your country, that's way difficult than increasing a particular core capacity by 1 kilowatt per person. You won't see that actually from the previous slide, because by 15 years, your smoking prevalence roughly just decreased by three among males. But look how many core capacity increased during those years. So the magnitude is not com not that easy to compare with. <coughs> but by getting a relative risk, that's the next step to calculate or estimate the global burden with this, the PAF, and the so on. <coughs> um, this is another data for females after adjusting all those covariates. Oh, sorry, I didn't show um, the data from colorectal cancer, but basically we didn't see any significant result for colorectal cancer. So as I say, then you can estimate um, what's the attributable cases uh, in 2015 among males and females. So yeah, we just proved like, yeah, there's an association between cobalt power plants and lung cancer at the national level. The next question is, is there anything we can make bigger, make the file power plants bigger? Yes, we do. So you can actually retrofit the SOX control systems. So how it works? So basically, um, there are a lot of um, uh, scrubber, uh, FGD things inside of the coal bio power plants. And it's, a old, it's, it's already well-developed technique. Um, those technologies were developed in the 1980s, 1970s. It's a well-run. I would say like more than 90% of coal by in the United States has retrofitted those um, controlling systems. <coughs> but it's not globally. Um, and then in another world, we don't know the health effects from retrofitting those systems. Um, the good thing is by retrofitting those systems, you can decrease the sun's emission roughly 95 to 99%. It depends on different systems. Some distance systems didn't work that well in 60%. But mostly, if you do FGD, so what we are doing now is to collect the data in 2012, sending that content, and use a cardiovascular disease as, as our uh, outcome of interest. So CBD is a very important, and it contains two major diseases. One is heart disease, and another one is pneumonia. IHD is more related to cardiovascular disease. It's more air pollution related. Rheumatic heart disease is contagious disease. It's more common among females and children in developing countries. So again, we use rheumatic heart disease and IHD as a post indication um, outcome because we don't believe that contagious disease has any association with a cobalt corporate. And our exposure of interest in national sex reduction so how do we do that? We sort of average um, the SOX reduction by summarize SOX redu reduction in each coal fire power plants in a country and weight it by the coal capacity. So if I have a 10 country, 10 coal fire power plants in my country, one is very big, the other guy is a small one. So I don't just average them by the SOX reduction. I weight it then by the Co capacity, each corresponding co power test. So that's why I, that's the way I did. And again, we regression. And what I really focus on is the sun reduction and the beta of life. 
And that's why I'm talking about a population attributable vector to estimate the global burden. Oh, by the way, if there's any definition question, just let me know. Raise your hand and you can interrupt me anytime. Okay. So the upper panel shows the total coal capacity again in 2012. And the lower panel shows the national size reduction. So for example, the United States still has a lot of coal bio companies. But here in the US did a good job. The stock reduction is really good, it's more than 50%. In contrast, like those that uh, South American countries like Peru and Argentina, <coughs> they don't have a lot of coal bio conference, but once they have, they didn't control the stock emission from coal fire problems in Africa. That's basically the idea. So let's look at it again. As I say, CBD cardiovascular disease is still a male dominant disease. It's more common happening among males, but it has a higher incidence rate uh, in 2012. But for rheumatic heart disease, it's, the last, it's a very small portion of CBD and more female dominant. You can see that from our data as well. So this is a soft reduction of uh, percentage and the other covariates we want to adjust. So what we are seeing here is by reducing stocks by a factor, reducing stocks by a factor of 10%, you can decrease what is associated with the decreasing of cardiovascular disease by a factor of 0.3% among males after adjusting the other covariates. And among females, reducing stocks 10% in a given country, the relative risk of lung cancer, cardiovascular disease, can decrease by 1.7% among females after adjusting the other covariates. Those tables are just absurd. There are more um, covariates I cannot show here. So let's look at the middle column for the IHD and the right column for RHD. So lung effects is actually more important or more dominant, more significant among uh, for, for IHD, um, both among males and females. But for the RHD, as we hypothesize, there's no significant effects um, for RHD. Well, let me skip the limitation uh, because I think I can save that for um, Q and A. Definitely, there are some limitations. Let's talk about that later. But let me jump into a brand new scope of um, the series. This is a totally different topic. Um, I guess you will be more interested in this one. Let me fill in, fill, fill in a little bit of information first uh, before we talk about this because it's more economic model. So back to 1930, a Japanese scholar um, proposed a hypothesis. And actually, it's a, it's a well done in the Macroeconomics. He said Japan is like the leader of the flying cheese, flying cheese in the Eastern Asia. And then the textile, Japan was in the industrialized before World War II. And the textile was the first industry in Japan. They used the textile as their industrialization step. And textile is replaced by chemical because supply and demand and textile, the increasing wage, uh, salary and everything make the textile cannot survive in Japan anymore. And the textile is required pushing back or pushing to the second tier country uh, in the Asia, in the same energy group. For Japan per se, they replace textile by chemical industry and then by iron and steel and then automobile and so on and so forth. And those retired industry will be pushed back to the uh, second tier, third tier Asian countries. This model actually mirror or can interpret the Rosso's five stage of economic behavior. So from the traditional society transition step and all of a sudden take off stage and reach the bottom, top, the five stage of that. So Japan goes through that um, and so that second tier Asian country, third tier Asian country. 
this is an explanation for quantum mechanics. And I apply this model to energy world. I say, we hypothesize, if a country locates in the same FG region, so make sure that pushing process happened in the same FG region. And the second, if an energy matrix, energy matrix means what's the percentage of a specific energy source to use in a given country. The energy matrix is relatively constant across time. So don't tell me that you use COA 70% this year, and 10 years later, you decrease your COA to 20% and replace it with the other energy. Then those emission factors will be different. Then your carbon dioxide emission will totally different. But as long as you have the energy matrix relative across the time, I say, I have also said, the per capita CO2 emission will mirror to the EEGs in the same energy group. Let's look at the raw data first. Uh, and you will more understand what I'm talking about. So the green line is Japan. The blue one is Taiwan. And the red bars are China. You will see Japan. This is a takeoff period for Japan in 1960. And Japan reached Patel, rapidly reached Patel in 1970, after 1970. And for Taiwan, this is their taking off period, 1980, 1999, and rich Macau after 2000. For China, they are still at the stage of taking off period. Look at the white axis. This is my economic model. It's per capita CO2 emission. Even per capita CO2 emission has a mirror pattern of different countries. If we Look deeply into different sectors, primary, secondary, tertiary, and residential consumption. Well, for comparing Taiwan and China, you will see primary, the scale for primary is too small. We don't see any pattern here, similarity here, but this is not like important. For a secondary and tertiary industry, you can see each uh, the per CO2 to protect that social emission from both countries mirror to each other. Actually, this is a leading force for CO2 emission in secondary tertiary industry. The residential one is the most interesting one. For China, you will see the takeoff period here just near Taiwan. But before 2000, what's going on here? Well, before 2000 or before two, uh, 1990, there are a lot of um, community-based heater in northern part of China. So they burn a lot of coal to generate heat in the community. And after that, a lot of five-year program or five-year policy, they try to replace those coal burning heaters, um, try to electrify the household appliance. So that's why the coal consumption, the CO2 consumption from residential and after that, the increase in after 2000 just mirror to Taiwan as their leading standard increase. So um, basically, we collect the data from the 12 countries in the same FG group through literature review. And we calculate the CO2 emission from Taiwan and China because um, the data in the World Bank is not that accurate or missing for the two countries. And then we check our second assumption. It's an energy matrix relative constant across the time by checking the energy from coal, gas, oil, what's the mean during the study period, and what's the standard deviation during the study period, and what's the ratio of that. If the ratio of mean to FD is more than seven or six, that we call it relative constant. And then so we run the model uh, as a semi-parametric model uh, to predict the per capita CO2 emission, the S-shaped model. Uh, anyway, so what we have seen now is uh, we don't think that China can reach peak in 2030. Uh, that's basically the conclusion uh, for, for the per capita CO2 emission in 2030 might be the top of the peak in China. 
this is a Chinese IMDC goal. Uh, they want to reach a plateau of the kid from 2030. And after that, they think that they can curve the CO2 emission increase. Uh, we think the plateau will reach about 2044. That's what I was thinking. Um, well, there, there's a. Uh, It's a wide band for sensitivity analysis, but once you reach the plateau, uh, the band will be narrower. So there are huge uncertainty in our study. But that's what we are So let me save uh, five minutes to talking about how can we exploit it from the data and how can we do uh, for the next step. Coal fire power plants is dying, actually, it's dying. It's not because of the politic uh, debates or anything else. It's just economically less feasible. Uh, because those renewable energies get cheaper and cheaper and will replace that step by step. Um, for coal fire problem, what we can do for the next step um, is not just air pollution. It's way more worse than air pollution. Coal fire problems also pollute water from coal mining coal processing and power plant per se. So it's hard to imagine like, from the mining those um, coal workers, although they are not allowed in the United States, but they are still allowed in global. Um, they have a lot of exposure to um, and, uh, less set water and air pollution. So what I really want to do as well is um, the coal fire problem and the water, water, we call it water energy coalition, which means Think about that, um, those developing countries who need a lot of energy to develop industry also need a lot of food to feed those people. And to grow those plants in agriculture, you need water. So that will be a coalition of water and energy for those developing countries. That will be a very important issue for them. And once you have no safe way to approach those clean water, then those kind of clean water will actually a secondary issue. Not just the malnutrition, not just um, maternal days, but also uh, like uh, uh, waterborne disease, uh, mosquito, those waterborne diseases as well. So how do I do that? You know, I have a data set of all coal biopower plants. I mean, every uh, generating units, not just coal, uh, but coal, but uh, gas, oil, renewable energy, worldwide, different time. And I have a column showing what the um, process they deal with water. So why do they need the water? They need the water to cool down uh, the process. When you burn all the ash, and burn all the coal, then you have to cool down the system. And how to cool down, you need a lot of water. Either one through, either recirculating or dry cooling. So if I know what the system they are doing, I sort of can estimate how much water you need for each and uh, electricity plants. So oh, I will really talk about that. So oh also the heavy metal demonstration. So actually actually this is a project working on with WRI World Resource Institute. They are focusing on India and China and use a Google map and try to look at where those coal fire problems are. And once you see it, you can know what, kind, what type of system, cooling system you are using. And you can, you can refill in the missing column of your data to so fill it out and find out how much water you need for every country. So we can do uh, disease of burden analysis, subgroup analysis for those vulnerable groups and also the financial burden from coal bank companies. Well, that's basically all of it. Thank you.